With Louis Gilbert in the director's chair, Roger Moore dons the tux once again to face off against diabolical Carl Stromberg and his unstoppable henchman, Jaws, in this globe-trotting, gadget-filled adventure to avert World War III in 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me. Good evening, 003. The following is for your ears only and is classified above top secret by Her Majesty's Secret Service. Our contact with the We Can Make This Work Probably, Podcast Network intercepted an encrypted audio message regarding podcasters assembled. For this season, the Podcast Network is looking to recruit field operatives from around the world to reminisce about the Bond movies and a countdown to the latest film in the franchise, No Time to Die. Your primary objective is to infiltrate podcasters assembled by recording and uploading your submissions at probablywork.com, utilizing a two-way communications device with a built-in microphone, the latest from QBranch. For a full mission report, Go to probablywork.com. We're all counting on you, 003. Podcasters assemble. Podcasters, Shugo! Hi, this is Justin Aki, graphic designer and one half of Significant Otter Co. This is Megan, the other half of Significant Otter Co. Yo, this is Corey Torgerson, photographer, film nut, and podcast hopper. Hi, my name is Ben Thompson. I'm from BadassOfTheWeek.com. This is Troidal Power from Too Young for This Track. This is MC from the best animated shows ever so far. Eric Slater here from Epic Fails of History. Today, I am going to talk about James Bond, The Spy Who Loved Me. And these are some thoughts on The Spy Who Loved Me. The Spy Who Loved Me. The Spy Who Loved Me. The Spy Who Loved Me, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying About Plot and Write a Love Story. It is the 10th Bond movie and the third Roger Moore movie. Taking its title from the 10th Bond novel. This movie is one of the best of the Roger Moore series. First reason, disco music. Pretty much all I remember about this one coming into it is that this is the one where Jaws gets introduced. Uh, It's not the main Jaws movie, but it is the one where he gets introduced. Like, the actual theme song for the movie is great. Nobody does it better by Carly Simon. But at least four portions of this movie, including the chase scenes, we get a banging disco track that just stays with you. Thank you, James Bond, for taking what was going to be around you in the world, and you chose disco. Other than that, I can't remember. I couldn't tell you which one this one is. It's got stuff in it that I remember, but I didn't remember that it was from this movie. The movie opens on a British nuclear submarine. We open on a Royal Navy submarine. So the opening of this movie has um, a submarine. Submarines are going to... Oh, oh, so many submarines in this movie. There's been a disturbance. Uh, Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. The movie opens up like You Only Live Twice, where ships, this time being submarines, are stolen by someone. Uh, But in the opening, we kind of are just getting daily life on the submarine, including a whole wall full of porno pictures. Like... Straight, straight up nipples hanging out on the wall there. The, the, these James Bond movies are starting to get a little bit racy. We see a naval officer looking through a periscope, and he says, My God. And we get a really A-tier, Oh my God, from the British captain. But of course, it cuts away, and we don't actually get to see what it was exactly. Both the Brits and the Russians lose a nuclear sub. Next thing we know, submarines lost, and it turns out the Russians have lost one too. Then we go to Moscow, where they're sending their best agent, uh, Triple X. Yeah. The first person we meet is a spy named Agent XXX, or Triple X, aka Xander K, I mean Major Anya Amasova. The Russians are going to put their top agent on it, Agent Triple X, and we're not talking Vin Diesel. For a moment I was like, did I download the wrong movie? Anyway, General Gogol, uh, the Russian, I guess, boss, gets the news his sub was lost, and he calls Xander Cage lady Triple X. So we cut to Agent Triple X, and it's this bedroom scene where it's this James Bond kind of guy, and he's sleeping with this really hot girl, and you think, like, all right, this guy's going to be Agent Triple X. They're like, oh, he's like, I got a a, a job out in Austria tomorrow that I got to get to, so I got to go now. We can't let this mission fail. But we don't know she's a lady yet. They even have a James Bond-type man in bed with a woman. Turns out she's the one that's the agent. He's just a boy toy. Immediately after meeting her in her sex scene, we are reintroduced to Bond in his sex scene. So off to a strong start. And then we get a call on the on the radio from the KGB and they're like, Agent Triple X, please come in. And it turns out it's not the James Bond guy. Their top agent is the woman. 
And right off the bat, this kind of indicates this is going to be a bit of a different James Bond episode than we've seen before, because this woman is going to be a match for James Bond. Then we see M asking Money Penny for 007 status, and she reports that he's on a mission in Austria. M says, tell him to pull out immediately. But um, <clears throat> and we immediately cut to Bond with a woman. Then we cut after this to Bond, and it's an identical scene. It mirrors the first one very well, where you've got their two together. They're making out on a bearskin rug, and they call in James Bond to deal with the submarine kind of thing. Cut to James Bond hooking up with some random lady in the cabin. And he goes and leaves, and then we find out that the woman that he was with is also, also a spy. Everybody spies at the beginning. I gotta give him credit. At this point, at least they're sort of aware of the tropes. And uh, she calls out some guys to come take Bond out. Sort of seems like a nod to the audience. When he gets a text over his watch. Yes, his watch. It prints out a strip of, like, imprinted metal, like it's a telegraph machine or something. The woman says, but James, I need you. And he responds, so does England. So he leaves and, oh no, the lady was hooking up with a double agent. And then some of the most 70s music kicks in. It's very groovy, baby. Cut to a ski scene, because it's been about mm, three movies since white people were skiing. So the main part of the intro, I mean, obviously we see the submarine, but the main thing is we get introduced to uh, Agent Triple X. Xander Cage is in this movie, and of course we get introduced to James Bond. Now, uh, Agent Triple X is a female Russian agent who is spending time with her lover uh, before he gets sent off to a mission, and James Bond is spending time with a lover before he leaves her to ski down the side of a mountain pursued by Russian agents. Now we get another ski chase scene, and I love the ski chase scenes. This one in particular is amazing, right? These guys are going really fast down this hill, and these are like the old style skis. They're very different from the modern ones, and skiing in 1977 is not like going to, uh, going to a resort today and checking out skis and trying to ride them down the hill. James kills a bunch of guys. You see the bad guys, they're riding, they've got uh, machine guns, and they're going with no poles. That's pretty cool. And then at one point, we see Bond spins around backwards, starts skiing backwards, and uses his ski pole as a machine gun. And that's pretty awesome. He takes out a couple guys with that. Then jumps off a cliff with the most ridiculous parachute ever. And then he jumps off of a cliff and parachutes with a British flag on his parachute, but not before he murders one of the Russian agents who happened to be Triple X's lover. That'll be important later. That's going to be awkward to explain later. If there is an overall positive thing to be said about the Roger Moore films, it's that each film has some type of unique chase scene. In this instance, the ski chase. So there's this moment here that feels like kind of a throwaway bond kill where he uses like one of his ski poles that has like a trick gun in it and he just kills this henchman without a second thought this feels like a throwaway moment from any other movie but as we'll find out later he actually just killed triple x's boyfriend oh and i forgot to say he killed the guy using a gun built into his ski pole because james bond then we see a couple really cool stunts. He does a really dope backflip. He body checks a guy on skis, which is really a bad idea in real life, but it seems to work out for him. And then we get the holy hell stunt. I really do love this ski jump. This stunt is maybe one of the most amazing things I've seen in any of the Bond movies so far. It's one of the most ridiculous things in the world. Bond goes off a cliff and in a single take, we see a man, the stunt double, he does the jump off on skis, drops the poles, dumps the skis, gets himself into a landing position, and opens a parachute. The fact that his parachute is the Union Jack flag, it's so cheesy, but it also kind of works. Love it. Now, as the parachute is opening, if you look in the video, you can see that one of the skis clips the parachute as it's opening. And in real life, this was an incredibly dangerous thing. The stuntman almost died because it cut his parachute a little bit. Um, they kept it in the movie because obviously you're not going to redo a take like that. But it's just an interesting piece of trivia surrounding this. Like, I'm not British, but this makes me feel real patriotic for some reason. They say that this part was so inspiring. There's no music for it. Like he does the jump and he's just flying and falling and you're like, oh my God, I think I'm about to watch somebody die here. There's no music. And then when he opens the parachute, it's a British flag. You get the James Bond theme. And according to stories, when Prince Charles saw this scene in the movie theater, he stood up and started applauding right in the middle of the theater. God save the queen. And 
and then we cleverly transition to the title sequence. Uh, we get the intro song, Nobody Does It Better by Carly Simon. During the chase, we have this very funky track, which blends so well into the theme. I do love how that was done. Cut to the credit sequence. This, while I don't hate this title sequence, it does kind of feel like they just got lazy here. But I will say they followed up with one of the worst visual intros so far. With that theme song that rocks. It's fine. It's not my favorite. You had these female silhouettes on trampolines and doing gymnastics around Bond's gun. But it works and you get a lot of naked chicks doing gymnastics on guns in the intro sequence. So it's a typical Bond kind of situation. Also the lyrics to Nobody Does It Better. I just want to start off by saying this is probably the best intro song that I've heard yet. It's not my favorite. I love this theme song. I guess this is one thing that I did remember from this movie is that I think the theme song for this is is really good. Nobody does it better. Nobody does it half as good as you. It's a good song, you know? It's sung by Carly Simon. It's it's I like it. It's a good song. <sighs> Oh, and also more nipples in this theme song. Like, you know, they do the, the ooh, silhouette of a naked lady, like they always do in James Bond movies. But in this one, lots of nipples. This really does feel like a Bond porn parody without the sex scenes. The Spy Who Loved Me clearly takes a lot of inspiration from previous Connery films like Thunderball, Diamonds Are Forever, and You Only Live Twice. However, its uniqueness in the franchise is a result of the heavy romance. The film starts off with star-crossed lovers held apart by race. There's a lot of traveling, duty-caused connection, lover spats, betrayal with the knowledge that the other will be fine, an eventual tragic backstory reveal, and almost no plot whatsoever. Next we meet Major Anya Amasova uh, in her full Major uniform. So the gist of the movie, it turns out that someone knows the exact routes that the submarines were taking, which should technically be impossible. One of my favorite moments early on in the movie is Q mansplaining to the British Navy about heat signatures. So the standard briefing happens here where M tells James Bond about his mission, and in this case it's that a nuclear submarine uh, has been captured. And uh, James Bond has picked up some evidence that shows that basically people can track nuclear submarines. Cloaked, not cloaked, this isn't Star Trek. Hidden nuclear submarines are being tracked um, by their heat signatures or something. So we get the plot. Uh, Turns out someone's tracking down submarines. They captured a British one and they captured a Russian one. They're not really sure how it's happening, but at first they're like, oh, it's definitely the Russians. But then we get the briefing over in Russia where... They, first of all, let Agent Triple X know that her lover was killed on a mission. That'll be important later, because James Bond did. Um, but also that one of their subs is missing, too. So James Bond and Agent Triple X 007 and Triple X, they're both on the case. The implications here are very bad. If somebody can track down the nuclear subs, then they can capture the sub fleet. Um, it d- undermines the entire defense wall against the Soviet Union. And on top of that, we now have at least 12 nuclear missiles that are not accounted for. Very bad stuff. Favorite love interest? Uh, Again, stupid name. But Triple X definitely gets bonus points in my books for not going dumb after sleeping with James Bond, like most of his other lady friends. Triple X is a great Bond girl. She's a decent spy in her own right. And let's be honest, she doesn't suffer from the standard sleep with Bond and become dumb as hell syndrome. She still knows her job. She still gets her job done. And she even goes as far as threatening his life until he saves her life. Bond is sent to track down whoever is, uh, I mean, tracking them down as the respective spies get their missions. It turns out that James killed Major Amasova's lover on the ski mission. And we find out she's receiving news from the KGB that her boyfriend was killed in Austria during a mission. And once she is done, she's going to kill the person who did it. And we're like, oh man, this was definitely James Bond who did this. And she's like, I'm going to kill whoever did this to my boyfriend. Right off the bat, before they even meet, they hate each other and they don't even know it yet. Also, I have a crush on Barbara Bach for years since this movie. One of the top three most attractive Bond girls ever. Even my wife commented on how hot she is. 
The woman in this, her name is Barbara Bach. She is Ringo Starr's wife. They got married in 1981, and they are still married today. Four years after this movie came out, Barbara Bach ends up marrying Richard Starkey, otherwise known as Ringo Starr. Yeah, she married one of the Beatles. Next, we cut to the evil dude and his evil lair. When we get to meet the villain for this movie, Carl Stromberg, he's a good villain. This one has one of the most impressive villain layers in the franchise's history. Very villain-like. Of course, after we get the briefing with uh, the agents, we also have to get basically the villain's perspective. We see him hanging out in his big sea base. This is one of the things from this movie that's iconic, and I did not remember that this was the movie it was from. And I will tell you that at the point that I saw the sea base, I also realized this was the one where James Bond has a car that turns into a submarine. Like, those things just go hand in hand. And he pays $10 million to each of the guys who helped develop the submarine tracking software. And this is a pretty cool little underground layer. He He's got uh, fish and stuff swimming around. He's underwater, and it's really neat. That made me really excited. What are these guys thinking? Sharks again. Probably my favorite kill is right at the beginning when the bad guy is talking to the scientist about his secret submarine detector. He tells the scientist that he's hired that someone's been linking information. It turns out it was his assistant. He tells the developers that somebody has betrayed him, and he doesn't know who it is, but, you know, he tells his assistant to leave. The implication is that he's going to kill these developers. And his assistant leaves, and she gets in the elevator, and he drops the floor out of the elevator. And he essentially dumps her into a pool of sharks. And she falls into a pit of carnivorous sharks that immediately begin eating her and devouring her. And then you check the Wikipedia and you're like, yep, this is the first Bond release since the movie Jaws came out and uh, that's definitely what's going on here. The most solid of solid decisions in this film was to play box air on the G-string as Stromberg fed his duplicitous secretary to the sharks. I love that this screen is hidden behind a painting of the birth of Venus. Rich people. Old school killing people, shark tank elevator trap, and a secret floating base. I think I've always kind of secretly wanted an underwater base. It sure is nice of Lex and the boys to lease out the Hall of Doom to a fellow villain. Stromberg seems like a dick, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little jelly. But here we do meet the villain. We learn about his secret elevator death trap where he drops people in the elevator into a tank with a shark. Gotta love those trap doors. I'd be really nervous getting into that elevator. I do like after he kills his two scientists in the helicopter, he tells the secretary to form the next of kit. Carl Stromberg is the ultimate one percenter. He's an egotistical billionaire with zero chill and too much money for his own good. Does he have an HR department for a secret villainy corporation? Very nice of him. I wonder if he has benefits. What's really scary is it feels like there's actually people like this in the world. Um, probably the best villain moment in this whole film, I reckon, is when Stromberg blows up a couple of scientists that were helping him, and uh, he immediately cancels their $10 million payment bank transfer. Carl Stromberg is so extra. Why did he wait till they boarded the helicopter to kill them? After this, we find that it is a very cool mobile underwater lair, and we get our first meeting of Jaws. Jaws! And then you're like, yep, they definitely saw Jaws before they wrote the script for this movie. My favorite henchman in probably all of James Bond is Jaws because of how ridiculous he is. And also we meet some henchmen, one who's just a boring guy in a suit, and one is Jaws, who has metal teeth because his name is Jaws. Or maybe his name is Jaws because he has metal teeth. So we're introduced to one of the most iconic henchmen in the history of the Bond movies, Jaws. An eight foot tall henchman in suspenders with a metal grill. The guy's name is Jaws, he's seven foot two, he's gigantic, he's very terrifying, and as we will later learn, he has metal teeth that can bite through literally anything, and even though he's one of the most enormous human beings you could possibly imagine, he prefers to kill things by biting them with these metal teeth. Even to the detriment of like, he could have his hands around a dude's neck and be choking him with his massive hands, and still he needs to get that bite, otherwise he's not satisfied with the kill. 
he's just a big dude, big strong guy with metal teeth, and he bites people's necks to kill them. So, all they know about the tracking system is that the guy, whoever it is that's trying to sell it, is based in Egypt. So I totally forgot that a big chunk of this movie actually takes place in Egypt, which I gotta say is one of the coolest locales we've seen so far. They really go out of their way to show some really cool uh, ancient Egyptian architecture. So they're gonna head to Egypt to try to track that down. Both Bond and, and Agent Triple X ended up heading there. Anyway, Bond pulls some colonizer stuff and ends up outside of Egypt. I want to go to there. Where it turns out his old school chum is a sheikh with a harem. That's fun. Uh, so we cut to Bond, he's riding a camel near some pyramids. Um, there's a little harem scene with some hot girls that's problematic for a variety of reasons. So Bond goes to Egypt, and there's this dude with a harem? Um, now as Bond heads into Egypt, he does run into a, an old friend of his who's like, Hey, you should totally spend the night in my sweet tent and have sex with some of the girls that, that live here with me in this cool tent. Bond says something like, When one is in Egypt, delve deeply into its treasures. And James is like... <gasps> When one is in Egypt, one should delve deeply into its treasures. Nobody says that. So he's, he's having sex with another woman. Another woman? Probably more than one. So yeah, I'm going to go with another woman. But we find out that he's got to get to Cairo to meet some guy. So as Bond's walking through this Islamic temple, we see these eyes watching him. Creepers be a creepin'. So Bond goes to Cairo... And here's an interesting story. I was actually in Egypt for two weeks in February of this year. So I was in all of these places like very recently, which is kind of awesome. And Cairo looks and feels exactly the same in this video, in this movie, as it does today. It's, it's almost completely identical. When Bond goes to meet Fakesh, he is instead introduced to another temporary romance who rather than pushing him away to save him from the assassin, just turns and lets herself die. So he meets a girl, she's a little weird, then she gets shot. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so 20 minutes in and Bond has already hooked up with three women? And what's up with this girl gets shot in the back trope? He chases the killer, kicks him like a hundred times in the ensuing battle, interrogates him, gets the info he wants, and then allows that guy to fall to his death anyway. So before throwing this guy off the roof, he yells, Pyramids! Finds out that the guy he's looking for is at the pyramids. Wait, which pyramids? We're in Egypt. That's pretty vague. Wouldn't it make more sense to keep this guy alive and, like, have him lead you to wherever it is? The assassin suspending himself from Bond's tie is already kind of goofy, but it is rewarded with that cold slap so that he falls to his death. And Bond just says, helpful chap. Holy crap, Bond, that's cold. What's wrong with you? But anyway, he gets instructions on how to meet with someone and shows up in the most 1970s outfit to the pyramids during the light show. They have this pyramid light show in the movie. During the historical sequence at the pyramids, Jaws doesn't seem to be visible to anyone but Fakesh. Bond and the Major do not see him at all. So how did Fakesh see him? Even based on their own placement in the next scene, it doesn't seem like he is anywhere visible to the public eye. I actually really like the lighting here. It's, it's very clever and the music's super dramatic. Side note, I was in Egypt in about 2005, and I'll tell you, that light show has not changed in 40 years. This is a real thing. So I saw this when I was in Egypt, and it's real, and it's the same. You sit there, and they light up the pyramids with these lights, and they play this recorded thing where it's like, right back in the olden days of the Nile. So dramatic. I swear to you, the music and the video and the, the light show and the audio track is identical to it, the way it was in this movie. Like... Like, I was just there in February, I saw this, and it's the same. It's absolutely identical. It's got this epic, like, Ten Commandments music blaring. I actually bought a bootleg DVD on the street from someone, but it's long gone now. Of course, when I saw it, there weren't a bunch of secret agents running around kung fuing each other, which is what happens in this movie. The contact that James Bond is looking for is there with the Soviet major with Barbara Bach. He spots 
Jaws, and he runs for it because he doesn't want to get bitten to death. Jaws chases him, uh, and James Bond chases Jaws. There's a lot of spycraft here of Bond tracking a guy, and people are tracking Bond, and ultimately they end up at the pyramids. And there's this little chase sequence in the pyramids, which is pretty cool. The guy locks a chain, and then Bond watches while Jaws bites through the chain, then bites the dude to death like a vampire. So during this scene by the Giza pyramids, Jaws pulls a Nosferatu. Where Bond runs into Agent Triple X and Jaws. Anyway, Jaws is there. He meets Jaws there as well. So Jaws bites the guy's neck, Bond finds the dead guy, and the Major finds Bond. She even has a crew with her, working with backup, unlike what we've ever seen with Bond. Um, so, like, the three groups are converging, right? The the bad guy and the Russians and the British are all converging in this one place, and this is where they start going back and forth a lot. And the guy Bond wants to meet up with is running off in the middle of the desert. If he ran the other way, he'd just end up at the KFC. Seriously, go look it up on Google Maps. The pyramids are basically in downtown Giza, and behind the pyramids are just, like, a mile of desert. Totally beats the old tomb. Also... Agent XXX is pretty shitty if she doesn't notice some dude clearly trailing her target. And so, at the end of the day, James Bond allows his contact to escape, then be murdered, then allows the killer to escape, and then gets jumped by the KGB, who catch him unaware. Anya is there, she's got some KGB guys, Bond takes care of them, and then bails. He defeats them and then makes his way to a nightclub and bam, the major's there as well. They go to a club that's having a whirling dervish show. Anya is there and she knows who James Bond is and he knows who she is. So there's a scene between Bond and Agent Triple X. I can't get over that name. Bond has drinks with uh, the Russian agent and lets her know that he knows all about her preferred beverages, about her missions she's done. And she knows all about him. Uh, and also showing how bad of a spy Bond is, she knows his drink. And they go back and forth. Is her name Anya? She also, granted, she also knows hers too, but it's fun, the back and forth between them. But they're talking about how they know each other's background, right? And she brings up the fact that Bond was married. Well, technically Bond was married twice. And in both cases, I think he was married for less than a day, both times. They meet a guy who then immediately gets bit to death. During some of the conversations at the casino, there's just this split-second gag of Jaws in a tiny car. And though it is kind of dumb, I thought it was very funny because they don't put any real emphasis on it. Jaws is not a very inconspicuous person. He's a 7'2 gigantic monster dude. He tries to get away. Uh, she mentions that he has a wife. She knows all about Tracy and how she was killed by Blofeld. So that's that's cool that that got brought back up again. And then after confronting Bond on his past and dead wife, Rip Tracy, he leaves her at the bar without getting his drink. But that's okay. She's there to try and buy the date as well, and she brings him his drink. Probably paid for it too. Very nice of her. Most of the gags are visual, and if you blinked at the wrong time, you could potentially miss what little there already is. But ultimately, Jaws steals the tech. He steals the microfilm that has information about the technology on it. So uh, both Bond and Anya um, jump in the back of Jaws's van and hide out. They think they're so sneaky, but Jaws knows that they're there. Bond and Barbara Bach chase him. They sneak into the van with him, and he drives them to the temple at Luxor, which in real life is about an eight-hour drive south of Cairo. It took us like a three-hour plane ride to get out there, but um, I guess... You know, geography is kind of meaningless in the Bond movies. Wait, hold up a minute. Was Jaws actually planning on them jumping into his van? How was that his plan? What exactly was he planning on doing next? And for all they know, he could have just driven the van off of a cliff. I think the moral of the story here is don't get into strange vans with creepy tall men with metal teeth. Jaws kills the guy they were talking to, but both of them are pretty decent spies and catch up with the bad guy, who totally knows they are there. But Anaya Amosova falls asleep on Bond in a very cute moment, and then afterwards, in a smart move before they go after Jaws on the construction site, Bond takes the keys in the car. Thinking ahead there, James. Man, there's some really great shots of Egyptian columns in this movie. Does Bond keep losing his gun? How? Most of the fights in this movie seemed like really contrived. I guess you could make that same argument for most of the fight scenes in Bond movies, but here it somehow makes even less sense. I don't know. 
They chase him through the hippostyle hall of Ramses II at Luxor. Jaws tries to crush them, fails, crushes himself after a fight. All these fight scenes are so awkward. There's just no music. This movie has had a weird relationship with action up to this point. We had that ski chase at the beginning. Um, we've seen uh, some weird, like, ooh, there's flashing lights and intense things are happening. But eh, I don't know. The action's been a little weak. And then you get this scene where they're following Jaws through some ruins. And it's just this, like, cat and mouse game. But he knows that they're there. And then they he pushes a block off and tries to smush them. And it's just, it's kind of dull. There's no music, just... Two men grunting. They get the film. Jaws chases them and then rips the car apart. How are you going to rip the roof off of a car and then not try to grab the person inside? She can't drive a stick, so she's struggling with it, which apparently was a real thing. She couldn't drive a stick in real life. And then Roger Moore started making fun of her for not being able to do the scene. And they just kept that outtake in because they thought it was funny and it worked really well with the sequence. Eventually, Major Anya, she figures it out, and she hits Jaws with the car. Still doesn't kill him. Nothing's going to kill this guy. He's got a bunch of rocks dropped on him. He had an entire temple of Luxor dropped on him. He got hit by a car. A bunch of other terrible things are going to happen to him. This man is indestructible. Um, but the end result is they think they killed Jaws, but they didn't. And uh, that's one. That's one time they think they've killed Jaws, but they didn't. Anyway, they get away. So I think I finally realized what I don't like about Roger Moore's Bond. He doesn't just say the occasional one-liner, he talks in one-liners. And he comes across as such a douche. Like, there's a time and a place, man. I get that you want to be witty and impress the girl, but you're just coming across as an insensitive jerk. Uh, Jaws and James fight, Triple X tries to betray Bond, they both end up escaping, and suddenly, Lawrence of Arabia music's playing. Because let's be honest, it's pretty funny the van they're in completely broke down. The car is falling apart. There's this great sequence where the car is just like continually breaking apart as they're driving through the desert with it. But they eventually find a boat willing to take them back to Cairo. 